Peltero Pickle, episode 35. Michael Conforto leaned into a pitch, should have been called out. We talk about it. Christian Vasquez set the tone with the Red Sox. Is the Mike Trout barometer a real thing? Akil Badu has the best name in the big leagues and perhaps the best start ever. And are the Reds for real? Episode 35. Check it out. Pelotero Pickle, episode 35. I'm coming to you live from Kissimmee, Florida. I don't know if, it's, if that's the right way to say it, but that's where I am right now. we got a pool in the background. Chris is doing his hair, but you can't see him yet. Episode 35, recording Sunday night, Master Sunday. Chris, how are you doing? Hello, buddy. I'm doing my hair. How is it? It's big. It's getting big. My hair is also getting big. Let's, let's do a hair off. It's tough to see in the light, but my hair's getting long. I got stuff going on up there. Didn't I'll put the hat back on. No, watch what I'm going to do. Didn't you just get your hairs cut? I got, I got hairs cut. I, it's probably the worst haircut of my life. It's ba- I basically have a bowl cut right now. It's unintended, but that's what happened. You know how you can tell you're not ready so I got, for one bun? You guys, you got some strands. Uh, yeah, I, I basically, uh, I basically got an undercut. It was supposed to be like a tapered undercut, but they didn't taper it. So now I just got an undercut. And my hair's not long enough to bun, so I gotta stick it out for a while. It's it is what it is. I'm gonna get a screenshot. I'm gonna get a screenshot from our friend in California, and he's gonna be like, "Oh, he's not a French painter this week. He's an eighth grader from 1996." That's kind of what we're in. Yeah, maybe she's a Pelletier haircut. Uh, Master Sunday, did you get to watch any of it? I know you're. I busy. watched zero swings in the Masters. So. Oh. All four days. I can't remember this guy's name. I can't remember this guy's name, but the guy that got second place is oh, the man. caddy from Happy Gilmore. Did you see this? No. I need man. to find – his name starts with a Z. So if you just type in Z, look at this guy. Look, he's – for anybody watching at home, he's the caddy from Happy Gilmore. There's better pictures. And that was a picture of his caddy. He said his uh, his his uh, sixty his lob wedge says Mr. Mr. Gilmore, I am your caddy, which is funny because it's from the first caddy. Look at this. Yeah. Look at that guy. Look at him. Nice. Look at it's him. He grew up and now he's getting runners up in the Masters. It's, it's a great story. The uh, shooter McGavin, the fake shooter McGavin account on Twitter, gave him props. Said he's said he's a legend. It's, it's great. He's a good. He's a really good golfer. He's young. So he's the real caddy. Uh, in Happy Gilmore. He's like, he's not the real, he's not the actual caddy, but let's pretend he is. Okay. Um, That's a better story. But he, yeah, it is a better story. But he's actually a minor leaguer. He's in the Corn Ferry Tour. He's leading the league in points on the Corn Ferry Tour. So they, they called him up, got his major league debut. Uh, that's not true. He's been, I think, in 15 events on the PGA Tour. But just showed up to his first Masters and got second place. It's pretty good. Yeah, I feel like it wasn't exciting, though. It's because, yeah, Matsuyama had a six-stroke lead going to the back nine. Ended up winning by one. Yeah, I heard he hit the first drive of the day, like, hard left into the woods. And then nothing happened. I didn't see his first drive. But he was – I was begging for a uh, playoff. And I just kept yelling, like, block it. Miss hit it in the trees. And he just piped, like, the whole back nine. He just piped I it. I think it nice. there's a lot. So, all, speaking of golf right now. This whole generation, this whole wave of like really good golfers is coming up, like guys like Shoffley and even Matsuyama and the the young, like guys that nobody really knows about yet that are kind of like getting themselves into contention in these tournaments early this year, late last year. They're all because of Tiger Woods. So this is like the first wave of pro players that grew up on Tiger Woods. Like that, like they're- So they're funny story about that. Elementary school years. Funny story about this. Zalatoris kid, kid. I think his name's Will Zalatoris. You know who his favorite golfer was? His hero, Jordan Spieth. That's where we're at, Chris. We are getting old. Yeah. Jordan Spieth is not old, and this is this guy's favorite golfer. That's Tiger. Tiger was like 1997. Jordan, Wait, Jordan Spieth on. is like 27 years old. Tiger was 97, right? So like, if you were if you were like born in 97 that's when like you started paying attention like you started paying attention when tiger became relevant like in the tiger dominance years there there, there was like a 13 year stretch where tiger was the man 
still is the man. Yeah, Tiger. Tiger's absolutely incredible. He unfortunately has a very broken leg right now. Yeah. But he, yeah, no, he sets a tone. And I, th- I, I saw one tweet: "Golf needs Tiger." It's like Think about what that guy did for golf. But he think about how many, he moves there's so many young good players now because he made golf exciting. Like most of these guys could probably be playing like in the NHL. They're such good athletes that they chose golf. Uh, yeah. Well, he, I think Tiger made golf athletic. I think that like he made it cool for the younger generation. He brought athleticism to the sport when it was used to be like accountants that played golf. Like the whole country club, khakis with pleats, like that whole like pants and a fat. I didn't say it. Yeah. Yep. Um, so that was the masters. That was good. Um, just general statements, not really topics for today, but just general statements. Ronald Cunha and Byron Buxton are probably the best athletes playing baseball on the planet right now. Those two guys have started very hot. They're very good. I think Acuna hit a ball that I think it went over like the second tier of the batter's eye. I watched the video a bunch of times and I don't, the ball didn't land. Did you see it land? Either one of you guys? I watched the homer. It, went, it was forever. The ball, like it was dead. It was right up center field. And I kept looking for like, where is it? Like you try to find the ball in space when it's like flying. Never saw it. It's really tough. I think to it went over the batter's eye. There's a better athlete than Mike Trout playing baseball. So I saw, I saw a tweet. I see a lot of tweets. Uh, they posted like the first X number of at bats. I think it was like 800 at bats or something. And basically, like the only one that's even in the ballpark with Acuna is Willie Mace. Like Acuna is beating Trout in every category. Like just blowing them away for for the early start to the career. Buxton's like 27, I think. I looked it up. And Mike Trout playing baseball. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. He did do a he, he dunked in the off season, right? You saw the two hand dunk off two feet. Acuna. Yeah. I bet he could, like, take a dime, take a quarter off the top of the backboard. Like, did you see? He just beat out a ground ball tonight. I think he ran like a three two to first. There was, was a video like it was dunk. a ground ball to short, and he just beat it out. It was like a love, fast kid in college being fast. Baseball players that are good athletes do like really cool things in other sports. Once again, yeah. proving and, uh, that baseball players are the best athletes on the planet. Yeah, well, because non-rotational athletes can't be rotational athletes, but rotational athletes can be non-rotational athletes. How much controversy is that statement going to spark? Baseball players it shouldn't. Spark. It shouldn't spark any. It, it's just a fact because baseball players need to move in all directions and they need to rotate. I think baseball players. Are the most, I think baseball players are the most versatile athletes. Let's put it that way. I, I, I would say fundamentally. And, huh? Do you think they're the most competitive as well? Uh, I think you have to have some semblance of like crazy compete streak in you because it's hard. Baseball's hard, and th- this is the part that like I think a lot of young guys are missing right now. They just they they miss or they don't either. They don't know it's supposed to be hard, or I guess think it's supposed to be easier. So yes. yeah, baseball is very hard. Uh, Byron Buxton, just quick note on him: he's loading on time. I'm gonna say he's loading earlier. He's not loading early. He's loading on time which is earlier than what he used to do. So now he's on time because he's earlier. I hope everybody followed that. Uh, and now he's rakes. His, his abilities are showing up, smashing. It's fun. Yeah. Uh, first topic, Michael Conforto had a walk-off hit by pitch on a pitch that was called a strike by the umpire only to be reversed by the same umpire said it was hit by a pitch with the base loaded. Uh, I believe it was against the Marlins. Marlins lost. Don Mattingly got mad. Twitter got very mad. Uh, I asked on Twitter if this is reviewable, um, to which people didn't give good answers because Twitter's not that reliable. Really? Uh, yeah, turns out that's true. Um, I, I still don't know the rule. I, th- I feel like if it's, a, if it's a strike, it should be called a strike, even if you're hit by the pitch. Uh, I can't believe the home plate umpire. He like rung him up, and then he was like, "No, just kidding. Go to first. What do you got? Whatever you got to do to win, man. Heck, if I was, no, I don't. I'm not mad at Conforto at all. Like, I don't. <laughs> you ain't no, cheating. What, you trying that kind of thing? It's not even cheating. It's, you're not sticking your arm out. What I didn't understand was how. Like, I don't know how he was. I don't know had the presence of mind to lean into it. I, I have no idea because I feel like once you get past college. You stop thinking about wearing it, wear it, you know, I call it, wear it. 
Um, I think it was, I think he saw a slider and he thought it was going to break him doing into him more. So he started to like, started to brace for impact. Then he realized it wasn't like a, a horizontal break slider. So he just stuck his arm out. Panic mode. It was really interesting. Um, when I saw it, I was appreciative of the fact that he got a stake to win the game. So good for him. But yeah, like yeah. I don't, I'm not sure. I still haven't really like looked into the rule very much because why, how can the pitch be a strike, but it hits you? and be okay like and then you st it still counts because what did they so i think the play i think the review it is reviewable to see if it did hit you yeah so that was confirmed that it did hit him but you can't confirm that the ball was actually over the plate i just the the the, the part if i was don maddenly the part i'd be freaking about freaking out about was that he called it a strike yeah. so i'd be i would just i would constantly just be saying like if you called it a strike then it's not a hit by pitch but that's what i'm saying he so didn't, like, how, he didn't how, take that part back how, who determines whether he leaned into it or not, or whether because you can't do that in the big leagues either. You can't like lean into a pitch. You can't. But and, and the so difference with the college game, if you, the college game you get you stand in the batter's box and don't move, here, like if the pitcher hits you and you and you don't move, you should be able to get the first the, base because the guy hits you. Argument I always got from umpires that they told me say if it's a breaking ball, like you can move all you want because it's a breaking ball. So like, how am I supposed to be able to determine what your reaction would be to a breaking ball or something off speed? If it's a fastball, like, and you lean into it, then I got problems. So in theory, that was a breaking ball, stuck his elbow out. Whoops. Sorry. I thought it was going to break away from my arm. Like, so you can't, I don't know. So I, the, I know the only thing, the only argument against that is that the guy called it a strike. All his I initial know call was that he called a strike. The Mets one. Yeah, it was a bad call. It was a bad call. Uh, we got the result of that play would have been, and I actually want to get your take on this on the major league level. It's not part of our topics list, but the extra innings stick a guy on second base rule. Uh, international play, they do it. I know you have experience with international play. First and second. How do you? First and second. Okay, so just to run our second. How do you feel about that at the major league level? Uh, I mean, I don't know. Because you've done both. You've I, yeah. I think it's I think it's shortened a lot. Like it's shortened games because it it certainly um, brings a lot more having to get it done type of stuff. Like you have to get stuff done, right? Because I mean, how many innings could you go starting with a runner on second, nobody out, and and not score a run? I I don't think the number is is all that high right like because what's the, mm -hmm. the a runner leading off uh starting at second like lead off double score like what 28 percent of the time or 32 percent of the time something like that I, I was actually just thinking i'd love to see the percentage of runs scored with this yeah, format it, it's something no but just lead off doubles right so it's a lead off double theoretically yeah. um yeah i i mean you're gonna score one out of every three halves right in theory so it's gonna it's gonna create more action and then obviously the team that scores first uh, kind of puts pressure on the team to score second. But if you shut the, the first team down, then obviously, like, I, it's going to keep games from going 20 innings, right? From who do you think has the advantage in that in this scenario? It depends. It really just it really depends. The team, the team that's if if you score, then you have the advantage. If well, if, I mean, <laughs> I'm just saying, like, th but think about no, but it from right? a from a strategy from a strategy standpoint, who has. The advantage. The home, there was an interesting the home, strategic the play that came up that I want to talk about. The home team always has the advantage because they get to see what they have to accomplish, right? Like they get to That's see. Fair. What they have. That's fair. That's fair. So, it, I mean, it's it's tough to say that. But the other day, for example, the Yankees. I know I caught the end of the Yankees game when uh, they so they bunted to get the runner to third, um, and then and then DJ LeMay who came up and hit a pretty good line drive fly ball to right field. Santander caught it, threw the guy out at home. Game over. So. Um, in the same situation, right? Like if you get that second out, if you bunt or if you move the guy over, you're still, you can still set up the double play. Like you can play it however you want. Like obviously you don't want to put the go ahead run or the winning run on first base, but there's just a million different things you can do there. I think um, it, it brings out some interesting strategy in the game that I think it kind of escaped like the ideas of moving runners over um, bunting, uh, thinking about intentionally walking guys set up double plays. But mm -hmm. at the end, like at the same time, you're never gonna have another 33 inning bender like the uh, was it the Norfolk Tides and uh, and Pawtucket Red Sox played it. Rich Gammon. Rich Gammon played in that game. Um, 
yeah and i actually like it i didn't think i would but i kind of like it i i it, to me the closest comparison is overtime in college football stick the ball in the 25 and you're you're in scoring position already like you, you got a chance to put up runs there's like you just said all the strategy comes into play so there's things happening there's there it gives you more incentive to kind of stick around as opposed to like you're at the game with your kids and it's like, ah, well, you know, let's stick around for one inning and see if it happens. You bring in a fresh arm, you just shove, nobody gets on base. It's kind of boring. So I like it because it forces action. Um, you're not with, with the way guys are getting hurt pitching. It makes sense to, to limit how many innings have to be eaten. Um, and it just, it makes the game a little more exciting. I like it. Um, I did want to bring up an, I, don't I wanted to bring up a strategic thing. Um, Patrick and I were watching a game the other night and it was, uh, the home team was up. They had the guy on second. I forget who was playing, but it was first and second, no outs. And I think they intentionally walked the first guy. So they had first and second and it was a deep fly ball. The guy on second tagged. It was like deep fly, like deep left center. Um, guy made a catch. Like it was, it was deep. I believe it was deep left center. Um, and I said, I made the comment that the runner on first should have went back to tag if at all possible, because, and I made the point because if he can get out of the double play situation, then it's just better. It puts more pressure on the defense, less, less room for mistakes. And I think there's, I'll be interested to see how teams strategize around that as they get more used to it. Cause when, when we were in uh, the Netherlands for the, with, with team Italy, it was very obvious, like these, <laughs> there's legit strategy around it. Like, are you hitting, are you bunting? You know, what's gonna give you the most opportunity? I felt like most teams, most visitors, visiting teams were swinging away because they wanted to score multiple runs to put pressure on the uh, the home team. But yeah, the whole first and ways. second thing changes them. First and second changes the dynamic, I think even more. Um, the double plays in fact right away. And you're allowed to score two runs in one hit if you get the bunt down. Um, yep. No, it's interesting. I, I don't hate the rule. I, I, I don't. I think it's it's good. It's exciting. Now, when you start limiting the number of pickoffs a guy can make, that's when I'll start to have problems with it. Yeah, the pick, the, the pickoff thing. I mean, how does that even work? Like, if you think the guy's stealing, you should be able to pick off. <laughs> like, you just can't do it. Like, if it's a left, you're just going to go first move because you know he can't pick off. I, don't, I didn't read the rule that closely. In A-ball, um, if, they, if they throw over a third time, they have to get the guy out or it's a block. So they're going to let him go to second. So – the only way you can pick over. So after the second pickoff, theoretically, the guy should just take off every time. Well, then the guy can step off. You got at least. Yeah, but all, like, or take, like, you remember the leads they used to take against John Lester? Like when you take like a half a base path lead and then like make yeah. it a one way lead. It'd be funny. I don't get it. Yeah. In summary, my, I have no problem with Conforto doing it. I think the umpire made a terrible call and denied us with. The new and exciting extra inning rules. Way to go, umpire. Um, I have a, the next top. Say it again. He's not losing sleep over it. No. No. Uh, next topic, I'm very curious. I, I handpicked this one. I added this my, myself because I really want to get your uh, your feelings on this as a, as a player who's been in this situation more than most people have. So Christian Vasquez, catcher for the Red Sox. Um, has to me emerged as a leader of that team. They played the Rays in a night game. Vasquez had a big homer latest in the game. And then the next day they had, a, uh, I think it was an 11 o'clock start or like a, it was an early game. And he was a DH second inning comes out, runner up first rolls over a ball and busts it down the line. Doesn't get doubled up as a, as a position player. I always looked at the catcher as like the heart and soul setting the tone. Like if he's back there blocking pitches, working hard for getting extra pitches. I always felt like that was a big deal for a major league guy, a major league catcher coming off a night game, playing in the day game to hustle like that. What kind of tone is that setting for that roster? How much is that going noticed? Is it just kind of like whatever, or is that, do you feel like that's a big deal? I think it depends on the guy. Um, I think if it's a guy you're used to seeing do that, you're not necessarily overwhelmed, underwhelmed, and it depends on your status on the team, right? Um, Boston obviously needed a spark after that first series because I think it would, it would have been very easy uh, for them to just kind of crumble. 
Uh, everybody. The, their first three games were very unimpressive. And I think yeah. they've run off six media, now. The Boston media was like losing its mind. They were freaking yeah. out. So Definitely they lost three in a row. Up. Now they've won six. So I think they needed the stuff. When you do stuff like that, it's for like it's really for yourself. I think more than anything else. Like it, it allows you to. Rich Kidman always used to say that to us. Like moments like that are, are, are like what allow you to kind of let out some frustration, take a positive moment out of what could be a negative moment. Um, and then obviously, like if you make it about your team and, and the guys around you, then I think it it's a lot better that way. It just it's it alleviates so much pressure. So yeah, I mean, anytime you see a an older player, a guy who's supposed to represent, um, you know, the leadership of the team, do that, then I think it it can be significant. Um, Boston still has to figure out their identity, I think, in terms of having some new bodies in there, new people, like who are the new guys, what's the leadership, how is J.D. going to respond to last year, can Devers take a step forward, is Bogart the guy? And I think a lot of those questions are kind of getting answered right now, and most of them are yes. And I think because of that, like I think if Vasquez can put himself in that role, I I mean, I don't think anybody necessarily goes into a major league season thinking like, oh, I'm going to lead this team. Um, but certainly it's just like anywhere else. I think there's a, a need for it or, or at least guys to establish the culture and, and what they want to stand for. Yeah. Uh, JD Martinez, three homers today, four for six, currently batting 472. Uh, Bogarts is being Bogarts. Devers has had a big game today. Hold on one second. Pause for some sirens. All right. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm excited about the Red Sox. I, I, don't really consider myself to be a Red Sox fan, like traditionally as a Red, like a traditional Red Sox fan from a like geographic standpoint. I do like when they're playing well. There's some nostalgia there, growing up in the Northeast. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm actually excited to watch Chris Vasquez throughout the year. See if he continues this. More sirens. There's more background noise. I think the show should always be done with background noise. I think you should put even if when you're in the office, you should put fake sirens on in the background. It's better. I can make that happen. Okay. Um, I'll make it happen. Baseball is always good when the best teams have a chance to be good. It's more competitive. I think the AL East is automatically more competitive now if Boston's relevant. Um, I like when people that aren't supposed to be good are good. So, I mean, you know, like the Red Sox were predicted to not be good. They were probably projected to finish fourth in the AL East, right? If you, if you were – I think that was the most projections had the Red Sox fourth only Baltimore behind them. So, I mean, they're going to have to pitch the ball to be good. Um, but, and I mean, we, you know, our friend Pete Fatsy, go Pete Fatsy. Woo. Um, do a good job. Keep hitting. Speaking Pete? of is production real early in the season, producer Patrick would like to know is uh, Mike Trout the barometer for when the small sample size has has become a real deal. So there's a joke that when Trout becomes a leader of all major statistical categories, I had trouble saying that word, geez. When Trout becomes a leader of the free world in all offensive categories, that means we've, we've found balance in the, in the baseball world. Uh, you have a really funny story about this. I don't know if it's, it's ever been told on Pickle uh, with a New York writer. When you were hitting like three, whatever you were hitting, 330 in September, and the guy came up to you and he's like, hey, man, you're really hot. You're still really hot. And you said, when am I, when it, when am I just going to be considered good? Like, I'm just good at hitting. I'm not hot. So uh, for you, at what point, there's like, was it 500 bats is when you figure out who you are as a major league player? Is that the old rule of thumb? Uh, How do you know? I use some choice words, first of all, in that phrase. And I, yeah. I deserve a lot of credit for that because to say that to a beat writer for the Yankees, like, you've got to have some – Huevos, you know what I mean? Um, when does it become real? So it's tough to say. I, it depends on how you perceive. Like, how do we know? When, how do we know when Byron Buxton is going to be real this year? How long uh, does he need to do it for? I've seen guys get to the All Star break, right? Having great years 310, 320, you know, 20 bombs, and then finish the year 260 with 23 bombs. So, um, mm-hmm. If, if you can do it for a half a year, you should be able to do it for a full year. Now, I'm not insinuating that, you know, you should hit for the same average or you should be able to hit the same amount of homers, but 
there's no way you should go Jekyll and Hyde in production. The year Cody Bellinger won the MVP, I think it was two years ago. Was it two years ago Bellinger won the MVP? That first half and second half looked an awfully lot different, you know. Uh, I don't know. What's Buxton's the a career 242 hitter. 242, we got, if we go plus or minus scale, 30, 270 is his number. And he's currently hitting 435. He's obviously not going to hit 435 all year. But is he a potential, like, 320 with 40 guy? Because that's the pace he's putting out there right now. Byron Buxton has always had those capabilities. That's why he got drafted sixth overall or whatever it was, or first or whatever. I don't know what number it was. So what you hope for with those guys that haven't produced at those – it was second overall, right? Uh, overall. Guys, guys that haven't produced at those super, super high levels that like, if you draft the first rounder, I, I think you need to be thinking about like all-star caliber players, right? Like that's what you need to be seeing in your future. Guys that have the potential to put up monster years, be 330 perennially. Right. So when you drafted that guy, you envisioned it because all the athleticism was there. And now you hope that the maturity and the ability like to, to hit and, and to deal with all the pressures that come with major league baseball are they catch up. Right. Because I don't think it's ever a skill. Like I don't ever think it's a skill issue with those guys or an athletic issue. I think it's a, and I guess you could call connecting the mind and, and the emotions with the body and the skill and the physical talent. Um, so yeah, is that guy capable of going three thirty with 30? Yeah. There's no, I mean, I've never had a doubt about that. Not with the tired swing he was taking before, but like with the one he's taking now, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Like, there's no question. I think that that you're looking at a guy who's, you know, a very humble, very, very, very kind young man. Didn't never really had that that edge. I think that like people kind of look for in, uh, in you know higher end guys. Very proper. I, I met Byron the year I think the year he got drafted, and I uh, got to know him pretty well, and. Um, just tons of humility and I think almost too much. And I think now you're starting to see a guy who's confident. Um, he's made some adjustments and really believes. And I, I hope for him he does because that, that would be a really exciting player to watch. Yeah. And going off the Kenny Graham scale of guys who make swing changes become who they are in the minor leagues. Uh, Buxton is a 299 career minor league hitter, 875 OPS in the minor leagues. Uh, he can run. He's got pop. The thing I like about the homers he's hitting, he's using middle of the field. He's like center, right center right now. So he's just going like big boy pumps. So if he catches summer out out front a little bit, they're going to be homers. Um, he's got pop. Is it scary to you how many guys can go dead center and right center now in the game, like with regularity? Is it a little bit like this isn't supposed to happen? So what I see is I just feel like the quality of the swings are overall much better now. Um, there's a lot more depth in swings now than what there used to be. So there's the bat speed's happening in a different place. The direction's better. So and the balls are it's better. not it's and the balls are better, but guys weren't creating the path. They weren't they weren't launching balls the way they are now. It's different now. I agree. Uh next topic. Akil Badu, in addition to having perhaps the best name in big league history, had one of the best starts to any major league career. Have you seen this guy? Is this guy for real? I just love it. First pitch, he's got a great name. Uh, first pitch of his major league career, Homer. Daniel Daniel Nava had a grand slam on his first pitch. This guy had just a regular old home run. Boring in comparison, but amazing. Uh, second game, grand slam. Third game, walk off, single. I mean, you probably just hang it up. That's pretty awesome. That's a pretty awesome, like, yeah, let's sure. ride that emotional wave. Sure. Uh, rule five guy, rule five guy previously had played his highest level of baseball in high A. Uh, I didn't go, I didn't go to the trouble of looking up his whole like roster status. Was he protected in the rule five and somebody just snagged him anyway? Was he in the, he, he was probably in the, whatever the auxiliary site last year and just smashed and scouts saw it. I would have to guess. Is that what happened? I don't even know. But to go from high A to the big leagues and hop out the gates. Good swing actions. Um, seems like a really athletic dude in terms of creating speed with his bat. Uh, I don't even know what position he plays, but he might be my favorite player. Yeah, other than your main Mercedes. 
Um, I, I would say, look, first of all, last year would have been like his double A year, right? It's hard, like just because statistically you had an A plus year two years ago, and that was the highest level you played at. Um, I, I think get, I think going from A ball to the big leagues is much less overwhelming than I think it used to be probably 20 years ago, 30 years ago, because there was a stigma, right? Like you couldn't go from a ball to the big leagues 30 years ago. Like it's never, nobody would have allowed it to happen. Um, you know, you weren't mature enough. You didn't understand the game enough. And this is like part of the, you know, part of the change in, in, in the day and age, right? Like, you know, if you look up at the Toronto blue Jays right now, like who are the veteran players? Like who are the veterans like Bo and Vladdy? Like, I, it was funny. I, there was a clip, and I, I saw this the other day because um, I was watching uh, Josh Palacios, big ups, Ferbs, DJ Ferbs, and Josh Palacios is a former Crazy real legs. baller. Huh? Crazy Legs. Yeah. And, That's uh, his name. That's Ferber's name for him, Crazy Legs. And Josh, Josh, I met Josh in his first year he got drafted out of Auburn, and I actually t- I spoke to him on the phone today, and I, I want to congratulate him on his four for four last night. But the funny thing about this was, uh, Santiago Espinal, like, is, you know, he's a puppy. He's, like, he's actually older than Bo, which is weird. But Vladdy was talking to Pujols in the outfield, and this. Vladdy called Espinal over to introduce him to Pujols, which is, like, wait, what? Like, so, if you think about that team, you know, they're – I, I would, what's the Toronto Blue Jays' average age? 25, um, 24. It's, old. it's not old. The funny, the tweet I saw on that one was, "Hey, come meet my dad's friend." <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's uh, that's the fun, you know. So, again, I, I think it's much less overwhelming now. If you went from a ball to the big leagues twenty years ago, wouldn't have nobody, nobody would have, nobody on the team would have talked to you. They wouldn't, have, they would have been like, "Who's this punk kid? Like this, this isn't okay." You know, you're disrespecting all our all our paths, our journeys. Um, double A to the big leagues obviously happened, so. More often, I would say double A of the big leagues probably happened more often than triple A of the big leagues. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's yeah, I don't think it's that big a deal. He went able to the big leagues at all. Um, and his name is Akil Badu, so like that's going to get some attention, rightfully so. It's a great name. Uh, yeah, his minor league numbers are not super impressive. He had hit for a good average in 17. 18 and 19, he did not. Um, kind of a crazy story, but good for him and great name. Yeah. Your mean Mercedes on um, is probably going to hit. I think he's going to hit at least 430 this year. Pecos League veteran. I think he's going to hit 430. I think um, he's going to win the batting title. What do you want me to say? I'm going to nickname him. He's a Hoss. H-O-S-S, Hoss. That guy, he's thick. He rakes. Dude, his two strike approach is awesome. Yeah. It, look, it looks like he stuck. Like I, I, the, I would equate it to like you revved your engine up for like a day, and then you just got it. To, you got it right to like before the red line, and then you let it all out at once. So that's like the definite. Like that's what most hitting coaches are like defining as like simple, right? Because he's already like into barrel tip, into like hip turn, like his foot's up off the ground. He's like, wah, block a time. It's funny. Yeah, we're going to have to do, like, full segments on him at some point. Uh, Cincinnati Reds, good start to the year. Question, is Nick Castellanos Italian? Do you know the answer to that question? I actually did a little bit of research on this. Did not find anything. He, he's born in Florida. His mom's from, like, Michigan or something. I have no idea why Patrick put that in there. Producer Patrick, questionable performance. Italian words is he Italian? End, Italian words don't end in consonants, boys. If it was Castellani, we'd be, we'd, we'd have some grounds to stand on. Thank you very much. Castellanos, Castellanos is a Spanish word. So he has Latin background, not Italian. If it was Castellano. That's too bad because you guys could have used him for Team Italy. He also played for Team USA in, when he was in like high school or college or something. Yeah, definitely not uh, a time. But the Reds are good. The Unless Reds you are good. Florida, um, Italy. It's like a, it's kind of like a boot. It's kind of like a boot shape, like, like a stocking. Does that count? No. 
Uh, the Reds are six and three. They were six and one, so they lost two in a row. But they are putting up offensive numbers. They're scoring runs at least through their first six or so games or seven games at a prolific rate. I didn't look to see how many of those games were played at home, but I know Tucker Barnhart hit like a billion homers, and that's probably not sustainable. Um, I think he had three in a game. What do you think is going to happen with the Reds this year? They got uh, Cincinnati, the whole driveline connection there with Kyle Body, Bodie, sorry. Uh, Cincinnati there, their pitching development is doing their thing, that driveline does. Uh, we got more sirens coming up in Florida here. Let me talk to you. You mute. I have no idea who plays for the Cincinnati Reds. I know Eugenio Suarez is the third baseman because he breaks. I know they got Tyler Naquin from the Indians. I know Joey Votto is in the process of having another terrible first half like he tends to do. Um, and beyond that, I have no idea who plays for that team. You just said Tucker Barnhart. You might as well have said Tucker Frawley. I don't know the difference. Um, yeah, and it was Naquin that it was Naquin that hit the homers. It wasn't even Barnhart. Yeah. Okay. So, who is Mike Mustache is playing for them? Mustakas is over there, and Castellanos, right? Other than that, I have no idea who's on the team. Don't know any of their pitchers. I know they have that one pitcher that wears like. Doesn't he wear like uh, Chuck Taylor's? That he he really breaks. Lorenzen is that his last name? Yeah. So. Yeah, he's a super athlete, like super super athlete. I don't know anybody else. Um, on he gets he gets pinched at bats for them. Is he still with them? I'm trying to find his name on the list here. Yeah. Mustakas is there. Naquin, uh, Suarez, Vado, Jesse Winkler. Oh, uh, Winkler. Mustakas plays second base for them. Winkler. Mustakas is the second baseman. Winker, I think. Uh, Castellanos I is good. Um, I don't even see Lorenzo on here. Is he hurt or something? Yeah, he's definitely hurt because he's still a red. Yeah, he's on the IL, which the MLB app currently has disabled list on there. They changed they changed the term, but it still says disabled list on our app. Good job, MLB. Um, if we're going to be sensitive about stuff, just commit to it and execute on all platforms. So What a good uh, idea. Yeah. They should be better. They should be getting better. They should be competitive this year. I have family in Cincinnati, so I hope they are competitive. Because I told them to be patient last year, and I want to be right. Now imagine if you're a um, Naquin, though, and you played for the Indians, and now you got to play for the Reds. It's like four minutes away. Up. You're going to get a change of scenery. It all is team, all team, all Ohio, first team. Like, who'd you play Good for business. in your career, Ohio? Wait, what? No, we don't mean like not college, like in the pros. No, I just played for Ohio. Yeah. Well, at least he's in the big leagues, so he's got that going for him. Yeah, that's true. Um, post show, Nelson Cruz. Is he like, what, what's he doing? He's just producing and still producing. What do we got? Patrick made an interesting comment. Bruce Patrick said. Thicker guys hit better when they're older. Is that true? I just think if you can hit, you can hit, you can hit, right? Um, the, his real comment, his real comment was that if guys are like twitchier guys that rely on speed, it's gonna fade a little bit. Yeah. If you're like Adrian Gonzalez, who your swing is always just slow anyway, like Pools, who reportedly has like 67 mile per hour bat speed when he's in his prime, like he's kind of tailed off. So that didn't work out for you, Patrick. David Ortiz. Hurt. David Ortiz was 106. Julio Franco hit till he was 106. Like he actually did it. Like if you can hit, like if you can hit, and you don't need to be like if you're if you don't rely on athleticism, you'll always be able to hit. Like there's no like like is there a scenario? I don't understand why like people try to keep getting like dogging Brady and saying like he's too old, he's never gonna be able to do it. Like he just has to throw a ball, guys. Like, that's, that's all he has to do is throw and move around the pocket a little bit. And he doesn't do the move around the pocket thing very well. He's just really good at going to the right place. Like It's like he needs an offensive line that allows him to just do a couple things really well. It's like Nelson Cruz, just like swinging at strikes that you can hit. Yeah, so – He's strong. I, He's strong. Like, just get strikes. Think about how many guys could have like, just continued playing, but, like, 
either they had a bad year and baseball wrote him off or like Barry Bonds like retired at what was he 40 41 and he didn't retire he got blacklisted exactly but he hit 360 his last year in the show David Ortiz like probably the best year of his career across the board is last year I mean guys like Hank Aaron I mean the game it's at some point it's more like the game moves on from you but obviously with Nelson Cruz, there's a place for him because he's, he's like producing. Now, if Nelson Cruz hits, has like an Edwin Encarnacion year, like he did last year, and he's on a one-year deal, probably ain't going to job the year after, right? Because like they'll just go with somebody younger. They'll keep paying you as long as you're hitting 35, knocking at 120, you know, 110, whatever. And because they can't – and especially because the, like their, their metric, the – the wins above replacement thing still fits the mold. So, yeah, I mean, it just keep hitting, Nelson. Go ahead, man. So, is he is he mortal or immortal? That was the question. No, he's gonna die. Like right? he's just like every other human. <laughs> like we're all mortals. Life's well, that settles the, that. that life settles went that question. In infinity to nothing. Yeah. We love- uh, do you think? Do you think he could? push himself into hall of fame discussion no chance yeah i know i know he's got the steroid thing um no no, no chance he's not a hall of famer just period i want to see his career numbers 421 homers if he gets to 500 he's not a hall of famer nope dh played too many years wasn't hall of fame nickname early on huh boomstick Boomsticks, good nickname. Yeah, it's not a Hall of Famer. Even, I'm st- and by the way, do you see? Th- do you see how messed up the the perception is that Patrick's in the background going, shaking his head right away, and going and doing like a needle in the forearm, like I the mm-hmm. baseball is such a holier than thou, like oh we're so clean and like we would never let anybody in that was accused steroid user, like. Dude, the, the perception in, in the world is terrifying to me of like the game in and of itself and and what like like these people that think that there's a magic pill to be good at baseball. It's it's a deeper topic than we can do in a wrap yeah, up. Yeah, Dan Emanuel posted a video, by the way. Everybody should go watch. Yeah, it. I was I was gonna mention that. I that was that was gonna be my post show. Ken Emanuel, uh, noted M3 metabolite tester, along with you, and. A Too bunch many. of other guys. Yeah. I just I my only complaint was I wish he was a little more enthusiastic with that video. That's coming from me, which says something. Your I'm first team all lack of enthusiasm in videos. I was gonna say that should be like my nickname, like a Shark Tank, Mr. Wonderful. I should be Mr. Enthusiasm because it's like a, it's a joke because I'm not enthusiastic. You can go with that sometimes. You can go with um that. no, I just this I, I know the story. I thought he did a very good job of like laying out the facts of it all, where it's like I don't think the public is going to care enough about it. I feel like the players union is the only way it's going to stand up if they put their foot down and will they do that? I don't, that's, there's too much going on in the world with COVID and like just life. The new cycle is too short to pay attention to all the details. It's just going to take more guys getting their lives destroyed, their lives destroyed by sense. Like it's just, it's not rational. If this was in a, like an actual court case, like the judge would laugh it out of the room. It's so absurd when you lay it all out. Uh, it sucks. Well, it sucks. I you've been dealing with it for way story. too long. I reposted on my oh, story. There's a lot of people with check marks next to their name that watched my story. Well, it would be nice if anybody was willing to stand up to Major League Baseball on it and not like be afraid of losing credentials or well, the, backlash. My my favorite point that he made, and this is like the hard part, is like, like don't allow somebody else's life to be like. He said something about the psyche, and it's it's gonna affect. It, it's like the impact that this has on your mind is terrifying, like literally terrifying. Because I thought I had. I, I just I, 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 I. Go ahead. I thought I had gotten to a point where I could deal with pretty much everything mentally until that happened, and that was pretty hard. Yeah, um, I I, can't, I just can't get over the self administration. Like the guy that invented the test took the drug himself and pissed in a cup for X number of days. To, 
Like that is that is the study. One dude, the dude who was trying to catch other people, like this could literally just be orange juice. Like they just don't, they have no idea. There's no control. Uh, I literally bought, I had major league investigators sitting in my, on a couch at my business, ask me questions about it. And I volunteered to ingest the drug myself so I could piss in the cup for them. Because I was like, you guys realize this is a single member study, right? Like I can go on Twitter right now and get a thousand people to volunteer to take this drug. It's not hard. And they're like, oh, well, you can't do that. You can't get the drug. It's like, well, then how the hell did this guy take it? <laughs> you can't get it. How he, like, to give me, give me the stuff that he took then. It was, it's so absurd. It's so absurd that, uh, it's yeah. so absurd that I'm going to spin this pen around on my finger as if it's magically attached to it. Yeah. I just wish like hair elastic on. the, the percentage of the population that has been tested for this is so small that if there is like, if there is contamination factors, if there's like, like you're, you're the needle in the haystack is so small for what you guys are trying to discover right now. Uh, I wish there was general population, even if it was like 500 people. Just have 500 people take the drug, piss in the cup. The whole like the guy testing positive 20 times in a row, uh, the pulsing effect, like the fact of what a picogram is. It's so absurd. It's so obscenely absurd. But you know what the scary part is? That nobody cares. Yeah. I mean, it's like, like, we like, like, is no. Wait, time out. We live in a day and age where a lot of people are, are pointing out a lot of things that they think are wrong with the world and asking for compassion from the rest of the world, right? Like, you know, whether it be it, and, and I certainly don't pretend to put it on the levels of like anything like major, uh, these like, like major social injustices, things like that. But at the same time, like when you impact somebody's life to like the deepest root of it, like directly, like directly impact somebody's life by you know, doing something that ultimately you know, just took their livelihood away. You just took their ability to do what they grew up wanting to do. And then you, you now categorize them like, again, like case in point was the way Patrick reacted when, when you mentioned Nelson Cruz in the hall of fame. Right. Like, and I don't mean it's not an, it's, it's, don't make faces. It's not a, it's not an attack on you. It's the way society perceives it. Right. Like it's the way society thinks about, what it is and that's the only thing i could if, see in my life if patrick didn't know you if patrick didn't know you and your name got brought up he would have been like oh yeah steroid user he would point it put the needle towards his arm that's it and that's i remember when it happened i flew up to toronto to like come get you basically um when it, at least when it went public and i was watching espn and they ran some graphic about like notable steroid users and it was like you Jose Canseco, like, it was like, what are we doing? This is like the most absurd thing in the world that Twilight your name Zero. is being put up in that, in with those names. Twilight for, Zone. It was, yeah. I just, I, I wish more people took the time to, to learn about the situation more. And just above all, just like the union, Major League Baseball and uh, independent arbiter could just get in a room and be like, we got this wrong. Like, what do we need to do to make it right? I'll keep, It'd be awesome if they did that. I'll keep open. I and my 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 offer to take the steroid stance. I would do that for you. My God. I, wouldn't even, I wouldn't even do that. I wouldn't even do that for my own playing career, but I'd do it for you post career. My God, I'm all done having kids. I could I could stand to lose a couple pounds, even though it's a bulking steroid, and you lost weight before. Like, it's a bulking steroid. You lost weight. That's hey, what sense. Did you freeze your urine at the time? Yeah, yeah. We did get rid of it when we moved. No. So I don't know. I, I had frozen urine in my, because the thought was I ate all the food you ate that off season. We went off the we went off the rails. We're talking about we talked about poop and pee on the show a lot. Yeah. Twenty sixteen was off the rails. So it's twenty twenty, I think. Yep. In much different reasons. Olympic for year. much different reasons. Maybe it's just Olympic year. Even years. You no, better not years. So. Olympic years, even though the Olympic travel. All right. Pickles off the rail. We just created so much editing work for Patrick. This is mad. Go get him, kid. It's All right. That's pickle. Pickle out. <laughs>